Hello, I'm David Hunt and welcome to The Art Hunter. My guest today is a leading figure in arts here in Australia and highly recommended around the world. His career started as an Aboriginal arts coordinator, then he worked as curator at the NGV specialising in major international projects, then ended up at Bendigo Art Gallery as director, of course he was, then back to the NGV. He couldn't stay away, they tried to push him out the door but he wouldn't leave. Our director of Queensland Art Gallery prior to returning to the NGV as director. Ta da! Under his lead, the NGV has become the most visited gallery in Australia with exhibitions by Andy Warhol, uh, David Hockney, Van Gogh, uh, Jean Paul Gaultier, and of course the groundbreaking triennials. We'll talk about that. It is my absolute pleasure to introduce you to the director of the National Gallery of Victoria. He's an AM, Tony Elwood. Hello and welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It's my absolute pleasure, as I said. Um, you know that I, I really admire what you're doing at the NGV and what the NGV is doing is excellent. So congratulations on 10 years. 10 years you've been there now. Almost. Almost, almost 10 yes, years. So this, this year though? Yeah, in it? August this year. Right, yeah. okay. What, what is it like running an organisation like the NGV that has been so successful under your guard? It, it comes as a huge responsibility. I can imagine. It's a, I see it as an a, a institution that is funded by the state, it's funded yep. by taxpayers, yep. it has a charter to educate and to, to demonstrate scholarship and to care for a collection, but it's got to be so much more than that. In the 21st century, it has to really hold a mirror up to the community and reflect how the community is evolving, yep. what new issues they want to hear about, what other art histories, yep. and the responsibility of how we curate, conscious of gender, con conscious of sexuality, conscious of a whole range of topics yep. that um, you know my earlier days at the NGV weren't really discussed. So institutions like mine, come with this incredible pleasure and responsibility, but also that weight to know how to constantly re-energize and reinvent them. Yep. And the one thing that I, I love about going to the NGV is that during the day, a work, working week, there are so many mums and dads with pushers and little kids running right through the, the whole place. You're really building the next generation, aren't you? What, how well, important is that for you? Oh, it's vital. I mean, we, we have a whole lot of, uh, I suppose, separate charters that we sit underneath the, the core audience that will come and looking at who are the audiences that we don't have, how do we attract some audiences at greater numbers, yep. uh, you know, all of those kind of things. We, we're very conscious that we want to see the whole community reflected when you're there. Yep. Children, and particularly young children, were one of the audience types that we, we actually really grappled with because a lot of parents felt uncomfortable or felt that we were uncomfortable <laughs> having them there, and we weren't at all. And uh, we established a really strong children's arts centre, yep. which we, we commit to heavily in terms of content and the look and feel of that. Uh, and also publications for children, labels for children. So we make sure, we even have tram parking lanes because they now come in <laughs> such large numbers. But it's, it's, a, it's a safe environment, it's welcoming, it's non-judgmental. And you know, a young parent with a child who might be running around a bit can, can actually be safe and comfortable. Yeah. And that's really important. Uh, although there are some times when I've been there and, and the kid is running a little bit wild and everyone, all the adults go, oh, because <laughs> like, you know how you, know, like, well, you shouldn't touch. Uh, but they are on. You shouldn't ever. touch. <laughs> no. <laughs> but the kids don't understand that, do Children they? Children generally are very well behaved. Okay. Um, I think you have to remember too. We have a lot of physical security around the building. You, you do. Yeah. And they very gently remind people how to behave if they need <laughs> need that from time to time. Um, but generally, that's quite a, a low um, a low touch point. We try to make that quite subtle where we, where we can. But if, if we find that someone's got a little bit erratic at some point, we can step in fast and make yeah. sure that, uh, you know, that we do have a big responsibility around the collection. So yeah. we have to make sure that's our, our primary role is to keep that safe. But it's very, very rare that anything really untoward happens. Yeah, uh, but you know, like, and, and it is good that they are there. Uh, you know, like, all of a sudden, there is so much on right at this very moment. It's reflected on the, the wall and it's pretty much everything current or just about to happen uh, that's on the wall here today. Um, you've got a portrait exhibition happening that's just open in the, the Potter uh, Gallery over in Fed Square that's you're in cahoots with who? 
Well, we've done that in collaboration with the Australian Portrait Gallery in Canberra. Right. It's never been done before. Wow. Uh, what is the, the newest inst cultural institution and the oldest, being NGV, yeah. we thought it would be fun to bring our two holdings together and, and see how that kind of informed not only the narrative of portraiture, but even just each other's collecting patterns and habits. Mm. It's interesting because the Portrait Gallery collect by sitter primarily. Ah. So if it's a famous person, then they select an artist and right. the artist is important, but yep. that's not the primary motivation. Whereas we're always the opposite. We're, yeah. we're selecting the artist first yep. and then the subject matter is secondary. So yep. it's kind of an interesting way of thinking and working. And it means that we're now showing people that we would traditionally not have shown, mm. either as sitters or as artists. And I think that's refreshing. And mm. the two collections actually talk together beautifully. Mm. The NGV Australia does a lot of great programming around Australian storytelling. And we're always trying to look at new ways to do that. Mm. And what I love about that exhibition, which is called, what's the exhibition called? Who Are You? Who Are You? Which is a great, great title, um, is that when you first walk in, there's no portraits on the wall. You're actually looking at the people that are involved in it, the uh, um, pieces of art from their, their part of the world or whatever. Yes, we've looked at a few different approaches to what it means to show how you identify and, and, and who you are and, how, and so on. So, for example, we have some conceptual maps from some Indigenous artists that mm. are talking about their identity through land. Mm. So it's a form, to them, it's a form of portraiture. Mm. So it sort of, sort of challenges straight away that uh, the concept of portraiture is not necessarily what you regard it to be, yeah. that it's been extended and challenged and um, gone deeper than yeah. it has in the past. And that's what, one of the things I love about this show, that it's not just these two different collections, but a very different way of actually interpreting the, the whole genre. Absolutely. And, and that's what makes it so fascinating. You walk around and, um, uh, you know, Patricia Piccinini, uh, there's a, a two pieces of hers that's so out there when you think portraiture. You know, like, but it's exciting to well, see it. That's a beautiful work that we own mm. that's uh, called Mother, uh, Mother and Child, I think it is. Yep. And it's, it's the two mopeds that have yep. sort of been given human character, human form. Yep. And it goes along with that long tradition of the portrait of the mother and child. So uh -huh. this is to us could be seen in that light that it's been informed by that long standing, you know, since the Renaissance, that's kind of a depiction of mother and child. Yep. But we've actually hung it where in the long view, you have the long staff portrait of the mother and child, where she's leaning across the child in the bed. And you look back and then you have the child looking up the mother with the Patricia bike. It's quite beautiful. Mm. I mean, it's not the kind of pairing you would ever traditionally do. Yeah. But it's just talking about the continuance of this kind of language and yeah. theme yeah. In, in painting or in portraiture in general, I should say, not in pa just in painting. Just over your shoulder is a ceramic piece. Uh, it's of an AFL footballer, uh, Nicky Wimar, and he's showing his um, chest that he's a black man. A famous statement that was made, uh, and there's now even a statue, I think, over in Perth, uh, which again is a very different piece of art to be part of a portrait. Well, that comes from the Hermansburg potters who in Central Australia, who have this incredible tradition, not only of making ceramic pots, but pots about their stories and their, yep. their values, their interests. Yep. And in fact, we have a very big collection of pots that actually show each of the different AFL codes. And, um, you know, it's, it, it's each, each artist has kind of like adopted a particular team and then gone and made a pot around that. Okay. But that's the one that to us is the most outstanding because it's so prophetic, mm. coming from that community, mm. talking about in, um, Indigenous empowerment and identity. Mm. And um, so we singled that pot out to sort of represent that community, but also to represent a really import, important moment that has been captured as a portrait through a photograph. Mm. But then that photograph went on to stimulate other arti artistic practice in different ways, mm. such as this one. So mm. yeah, it's quite beautiful. Yeah, it's fantastic. Then the, the big one right this very moment that you've got, taking up the whole floor of um, the international is, what's it called? Chanel? No, queer. <laughs> no, <laughs> queer. Oh, Chanel's there. Yeah, we'll get to Chanel. But of queer. course it's queer. There's yep. five galleries. It's a huge show. Mm. It's uh, 400 artworks yep. from antiquity to contemporary. Yep. It's all from our own collection. Yep. It's landmark show. There's never been an institution. I, don't, I can't think of one globally that's done it to this scale. And I can only think of a handful of institutions around the world who've even tackled the subject. Um, so uh, it's called Queer, which is the LGBTIQ plus community. Mm -hmm. uh, and as you said, it's all from your collection. Mm -hmm. And so the, there's five curators involved mm -hmm. in it. And the work that they must have had to go through to, to find well artists that um, you know, like might have been or could have been or it's obvious that they are but they weren't at the, at the mm -hmm. time. 
uh, finding those pieces or just uh, a hint at it or stories of um, uh, you know like uh, kings English kings that were and and you stories know. of suppression yeah in those historic collections particularly yeah where, where they were trying not to tell this story but our curators knew what 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 potentially was being told or or should have been told yeah this was a project that we came up with during the marriage equality oh, okay. debate yep and uh, it started with two curators who said to me, you know, we're working on a journal at the moment, our annual art journal, which is a scholarly journal we do. And they did a queer themed edition. Mm -hmm. They said, we're finding all this content and we could just keep going and keep going. It would make a wonderful exhibition. And then with the marriage equality debate, which sort of, you know, hurt a lot of queer people, you know, the, it felt very intrusive and uh, confused, uh, I think, a lot, of, a lot of individuals in our society. And they said, well, we really need to make a bigger statement outside of just doing it in a journal. And so we talked about doing a small gallery, sort of like a, a pendant show based yep. on a few key objects. Yep. And that's sort of where it started. Well, we'll do some Greek and Roman pots. They're quite easy to understand. <laughs> a few royal you know, 18th century etchings and, and then you know, Andy Warhol and co. But it just got so much more complex, so much so that we brought on three other curators. And during COVID, it became a really deep research commitment across a really talented group of people, but people that also mm. represented vastly different disciplines yep. in our collection. Yep. And the one thing they said was, let's, let's turn the mirror onto those queer narratives that have been, for whatever reason, not told or not told explicitly enough. And it's a great way of you know, revitalizing aspects of the collection, but also coming in with more truth and honesty about history and the way that history gets interpreted or, or shifted or mm. reinforced, amplified even in today's mm. term. And uh, it was compelling. And we could have had six or 700 works, as it turned out, but we got to five galleries in the entire top floor and said, we've got to stop at some point. <laughs> but we've gone and produced a, a four or 500 page Whoa. catalog as well. Yeah. Commissioned a lot of international writers to talk about all the issues around how people identify, how art history has reinterpreted things yeah. or forgotten things. It's become a really landmark project and it's getting a lot of international attention as Fantastic. well as local attention. Yeah. yeah, because you can tell the time and effort that's gone into when you walk around and you, you're reading bits and pieces, you just go, whoa, the amount of work that's gone in. So congratulations Thank on you. that. And that's the great thing about it. It's, it's, it's a great way to celebrate the collection, but even for people to just understand a deeper sense of history mm. and histories that have been untold for so long. Mm. So, yeah. And it's free as well, it's which is the fantastic side absolutely, of it. Absolutely. Yeah. Now, there's a building. What? Why am I? Why have I got an image of a building uh, up there? Is there something happening with the NGV? A new building? There is, David. <laughs> it's called NGV Contemporary. Yeah. And it will be a standalone building. It will be a 60 meter high, 30,000 30, square meter Whoa. gallery. It's the uh, the largest building of its type anywhere in our region. Um, committed to post-2000 artistic practice, but art and design as a part of that brief. There will be three enormous floors of galleries, and galleries that actually have proper height and proper weight bare loading uh, uh, demands and, and, and so on, attributes. Because you know, so often our contemporary art, which is, can, be, can be quite expansive, it can have a whole lot of needs, uh, we can't meet those standards here. We see them when we go to the Tate or we go to MoMA, mm. um, but here we are as a, a city of great standing and a, that, that really prides itself on its cultural credentials, but it's been constrained. And so often we've had to say no to things that we dearly wanted to oh, do, whoa. but yeah. couldn't. Yeah. Now we can. Yep. Also collecting extremely well in that area, mm. locally, nationally and internationally. And we've really got no space in the St Kilda Road building to show that. And NGV Australia is constrained that as well so this allows a really meaningful engagement with art of your own time yep and you know well well it's done well in, in in cities across australia we've always felt it needed to go up to another level of, mm. of of presentation and depth and this will do it and you've been involved in in the project right from the beginning yeah. uh the design has come up i love it the, the amount of people are saying oh it's a toaster or it's a blender or and you'll always get that with uh, contemporary buildings but uh, and it's so different to what i thought it might have been i, I didn't really have a thought but you you've really chosen something that will will stand up in in time you know like 50 years time it's still going to look very contemporary well, I, I love that response because that was the feeling that it angela candelapis who's the the architect for this it was an australian only design competition too we we said Brilliant. we wanted to contain it to australian architecture yeah 
practice only because you know when you get a sizable budget like this and this is the largest budget for any cultural um, institutional project ever in Australia wow it they always go to the same handful of international stars and they're great architects but yep. we felt we needed to provide that opportunity to a practice that would never get it in mm. our own country Angelo was it was this successful applicant an amazing man a Greek Australian who really understands with great depth the architectural history of our city and of our precinct. He's enamored with Saroy grounds and Mario Bellini's um, reimagination of the St Kilda Road building yep. and said it has such authority and dignity, I need my building to you know, come across in the same way. Yep. It has to have a certain timelessness, but it's still very much reflecting our era now. I mean, there's a lot of new approaches. There's three floors of big verandas that look out across the garden. There's big window galleries at each end that also connect you to the precinct. It's, it's a very inclusive and generous design, but most of the magic happens when you go inside. Yep. And when you go inside, you discover this huge rotunda that goes right all through the building. Um, there's a whole lot of little hidden surprises and little rooms that you wouldn't imagine. It's, it's, it's exquisite and it is timeless, yep. but it does reflect the needs of practice and audiences today. Mm. It's not on ground level. You actually, do you have to, go, you know, like only looking at it vaguely um, through the images that I've seen, uh, do you have to actually go into lifts or is it, it on ground level at, at some stage? It's about seven stories, yep. but it, what happens is this is a reimagination of the entire precinct. Mm. The building is certainly one of the key elements, but the entire groundworks, all the gardens get re completely reimagined, starting from when you cross Princess Bridge and come across to the Art Centre, mm -hmm. who are also getting significant upgrades at the same time. And this big inclusive meadow garden that's been designed uh, becomes in itself a, a new urban park, which Melbourne hasn't had anything like this for a hundred years Fabulous. in the city. Uh, which will also have around 40 sculptures that we will curate from our own collection and some yep. commissions we're doing. And then you, we actually close the road behind our existing garden, Sturt Street, and then the garden extends across that road. Ah. Then you can enter the gallery at that level, but you can also enter it a story below from uh, from where the ABC and Melbourne Recital Centre and right. NTC are. Okay. And ACCA. So, you know, you've got two entry points and it's like a thoroughfare now to connect that whole precinct. People don't realise that the amount of arts infrastructure in that one area yeah. makes it one of the largest art precincts in the world. Oh, okay. And this garden and, and this whole reimagination of this area will really start to reinforce it in the way that we've done so successfully with the sports precinct. Yep. And as you say, how many cities in the world can you walk to a sports precinct from the CBD and to a major arts precinct? Mm. It's going to be magnificent. Yep. And, and the gallery is only six years away. Mm. So, oh, is that all? Six years? Mm. Wow, a lot of work to do mm -hmm. in six years. But it'll be magnificent. It's it will it. be. And yeah, I can't wait for those six years to, to come around. And that will come around quickly anyway. Yeah, yeah. Uh, now, you, you mentioned before um, fashion. Um, you. you you, a lot of the time you, we don't associate um, a, a, you know, an establishment like a, a gallery like yours with fashion, but of course there's all the textile side of um, the NGV, isn't there? And you've had some, I um, mentioned Jean-Paul Gaultier uh, before, but um, you, you've got a major exhibition on right now. We do. We have the Chanel Retrospective, which yep. is a show that we secured actually from Palais Galliera. We curate a lot of our big fashion shows, but this one we thought was so important we would work with the Galliera in Paris to take that. That's the, mm. the fashion museum that's run by the city of Paris. But, you know, we've been collecting textiles and fashion mm. since 1940, mm. and we're one of the oldest collections anywhere in the world. But fashion is collected by many, many galleries. It's seen as a vital part of the design vocabulary. I mean, look at the Met. Costume Institute, for example, that Anna Wintour chairs. I mean, that's oh, okay. one of the key exponents of fashion practice anywhere. Yep. V&A do it beautifully. Mm. Um, San Francisco, I mean, there, there's so many that do it around the world. We're unique in our part of the world in terms of our commitment to it, but it's a very, very strong commitment. Mm. We're a huge couture client from brands around the world. Uh, we also support emerging designers. Uh, and that includes all the attributes that go with costume. So whether it's millinery or shoes and jewelry and so mm. on. Uh, and it's a very, very popular part of the gallery experience. Mm. And, and so different and bringing a whole a, you know, like different crowd to the gallery, like the kids. It's amazing um, how diverse a fashion audience is though. People yeah. think it's going to be okay. you know, a certain demographic and a certain sort yeah. of where it's so much broader because it's a, it's a form of design that everyone can in some way relate to. You may not wear a couture ball gown, 
but you understand the process of, of looking and admiring something mm. like that and what it would be, you can imagine what it would be like to acquire it, to touch it, to mm. look at the stitching and all those mm. kind of things. And it's, and it's kind of otherworldly for most people mm. too. There's something about taking you into another level of uh, Absolutely, and, and seeing the detail because mm. a lot of it's hand sewn, isn't oh, it? The, the artistry behind mm. uh, really high-end fashion is mm. truly breathtaking. Mm. Like looking at a great painting or a great mm. piece of furniture. Mm. The, 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 the artisans behind mm. the ideas are, are incredible. But you know, so are the designers. The designers that think up some of the mm. combinations and mm. interpretations of style and so on. A phenomenal. Yeah, true artists. True they artists. Are. Yeah. They are. Now, many years ago, now it's before you were there. Um, you know, the winter masterpieces came along, uh, and um, I believe there was a story going around at the time that the state government said, "Now, come on, the NGV's got to lift its game. You know, not enough people are coming." So that's why that was um, created, and it's just gone on from strength to strength. This year, you've got one of my favourite artists coming along. Uh, Picasso, but you're doing a twist on it again. Tell us ab about what you're doing with Picasso well, this year. Well, I can also tell you a bit about the Melbourne Winter Masterpiece series because I was yep. there as the deputy director when it was all started. Oh, okay. And in those very early meetings. So did I get it right? Was that? Yeah, it, it loosely. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> what happened was Victorian major events had been established and they were looking at seasons that needed to be bolstered. What, what were the weak seasons for? Tourism and cultural tourism being one of the great growth markets. And they said our winter season, you know, Melbourne, the sense it was a bit bleak and people mm. only came for the footy. We need a, a cultural event that would sort of counter that and bolster that in, mm. in some way. And could we do a unique show from only the greatest collections in the world and do it annually? Because a lot of galleries do it every 18 months, two years, three years. This is about being regular and reliable for high quality, quality cultural content generally in a historic realm, generally, mm -hmm. and making that just an annual ongoing new strength in our tourism calendar. And that's what we did. And I've worked on probably 80% of those shows ever since their inception. And so we do have a certain formula we work with. They must be ambitious. We prefer them to be unique or very limited other venues, no other venue in our region, yep. and of the best of their type. And what I love about them, Tony, as well, and we haven't spoken about Picasso yet, is that the way you present it, um, your, your, your people, your um, design people, it, it's just a treat, you know, like you're there to see the art, but everything else that's going on, the way you're you know, directed through the exhibition is becoming a real centrepiece of the NGV as well. Well, we, we've taken exhibition design very, very seriously as a part of the overall experience. Yes, it's nice to see the art on the wall, but mm. you know, just historically, and there's still galleries around the world that you know, they have a white wall, the walls exist wherever they are when they were made a million years ago, and they just put the same <laughs> ones on, and, and, and it's the work that changes. And I understand that, yes, we are there primarily for an art experience, but there's so much more you can do these days mm. with lighting, with, with the change of palettes and orientation through a space. It just stimulates you because it's like being in another mm. space you've never been in before, yeah. even though it's the one you're going to regularly. Yeah. And we have a, a very large, the largest exhibition design department in the country. And we work hard to make that as, as compelling as the art itself. So the two brought together really stimulate you and make you want to go back. Mm. And because each show is so different in character anyway, we can really work on how to, mm. how to make that mm. a, a key thing. Mm. And Picasso will do that. We're already talking about a, a very unique presentation of how Picasso you will are. be shown. Yeah. And it's the whole of the ground floor. It's one of the biggest shows we've ever mounted. Ah, oh, okay. It's 170 works in total, 70 alone just from Picasso, 100 works from 60 other artists who really worked alongside him, collaborated or shadowed him or inspired by him mm. across a, you know, his entire life, which is effectively the 20th century. Yeah. And so the concept of this show was, let's look at Picasso's century. Big term, big statement, but he really did have most of the art world under his spell during most of his career. We've worked with, um, 10 years ago we started on this project too. Whoa. Yeah. We've worked with the deputy director of the Pompidou in Paris, who said, if you want the best show, because I did go there saying, what's the best show I could have? I've just become the NGV director. <laughs> he said, well, it must be Picasso. He said, he's the dominant figure in, in, in 20th century art. But if you wait long enough, we'll secure every major work because you know, they're, they're always requested three, four years out in advance. Yep. He said, but if you, you're patient, we'll just always reserve the best ones yep. for this year. And you were, 10 and years. They, and they did. And then we talked about the men and importantly, the women that he positively collaborated with or he was aware of them kind of 
being aware of him yep. in his practice. Mm. And so it's a, it's a very interesting, complex, but enjoyable narrative. It's a partnership between the Pompidou and the Musée Picasso. They've never partnered on a major show like this before. Okay. And NGV has co-curated it with the yeah. Pompidou. Yeah. So it is it, it's truly a landmark exhibition. Yeah. Can't wait to see it. Can't wait to see it. Um, on, on the other side, you know, leave through the gift shop, uh, your publications are so good. And you mentioned about the queer one. Uh, and you, you actually have your own publishing company, don't you? We do. We're the, we're the largest art publisher in Australia. We do Whoa. about... I know. It's, 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 it, we love publishing. publishing. <laughs> we love it. Um, and so we do everything in-house. Yeah. Um, editorial, design, everything. And um, we do around 40 to 45 titles a year. We've started winning a lot of global awards. We didn't enter our books in competitions and one day we thought we should try yeah, this yeah. about th- three or four years ago. And you know, like the triennial catalogue, two, 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 two iterations of that catalogue, yep. won best art book um, globally. Fantastic. Three years apart, they both won, won that yeah. separately. So that's a great way of stimulating you to say you're, you're on track and keep going. We, dis- yeah. we do distributions globally for that as well. So you know, the NGV brand gets respected and known even more broadly, yep. but also the opportunities for local writers and, mm. and, and also collaborating with international authors is you know, really important. And then, of course, the book fair, yes. uh, which um, is a huge event now, isn't it? Yeah, we started that about five years ago. And uh, we were conscious of all these sort of backyard publishers in Melbourne, you know, people in garages churning out beautiful bespoke books and often not getting much presence or, or interaction with their, their audience. And the idea was that this would al- enable that, plus the opportunity to bring in every year some major international publisher to network and share their knowledge and, and, and expertise. So it's something, it, it's very popular. It's, mm. it's, it's on for about three days every year. Yep. The thing that surprises me the most though with that yeah. event is how many 20 year olds come oh. en masse. They love it. It's, it's got a very, it's got, it's got a certain broad appeal, but there is a particular young demographic that are loving books. Out why? I think they just recognize the beauty and importance of, of literature and, and, and design, because some of them are more design led. Yep. But, uh, and the, the, the Melbourne has a very, very strong culture, it always has had, of uh, doing even really bespoke, beautiful, artisanal kind of books and so yeah. on. Uh, right down to zines as well, which are now very popular. Mm. Yeah. And because we, we keep on hearing that, you know, like uh, books, no one's reading books, but that's all turned around again, hasn't it? I, 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 absolutely. Yeah. You know, our book sales are very, very high. And yeah. the demand for new titles and new concepts around publishing uh, is ongoing. So, yeah. no, it's, it's alive and well. Yeah. yeah. Now, across the road at the, the Pont, uh, uh, Potter Gallery uh, in the NGV, uh, you know, like your Aboriginal, you know, like it's so big, your collection and y- your background, as I mentioned at the top of the show, that's where you started. But you must be very proud of what you've achieved there because um, you're doing great stuff. Thank you. Our Indigenous collection is the most comprehensive in the country. Um, people don't often realise it's a national collection. We represent the whole country and um, it's active in terms of how we curate. Uh, at the moment, we've been looking particularly at urban practice and solo artists. Mm-hmm. Um, we've just recently done a beautiful Marie Clark exhibition, for example, yep. Destiny Deacon. Yep. Uh, we're working at the moment on a number of other local artists that I think really are well deserving of a major show. Did a great one on Brooke Andrews several years ago. And um, we're also conscious of all the other remote communities and have projects in play and for them. And we recently did a big Tiwi show. But it's a, a vital part of our mm. collecting and, and, and philanthropic mm. um, practice and, and history and interest and gen- we find general Australian community members want to come in and learn and understand more mm. and uh, often don't know what the questions are to ask or how to sort of find some way in and this can do that beautifully. Yep. We've just moved our permanent collection of Indigenous art back to the ground floor as well which is a great introduction for people to understand the depth of practice, yep. the diversity of community. Yeah, it's very rewarding and growing with interest and has a huge international interest and we're finding more and more shows around the world yep. uh, on Australian Indigenous art as yep. well so it's, yep. it's very exciting. Yeah and just quickly still at, in that gallery is um, Top Arts uh, which I always love um, going and seeing the youth, the year 12 students and um, a certain amount of them, are, uh, how many, is it, does it change every year or 
how many works. Uh, how many how many students are involved? Oh, I don't know. The it, it varies, number. I think, doesn't yeah, it? I yeah, I think it might. Uh, but what a great opportunity for mm. them to be, yeah, you know, their art at the NGV. We've now got this interesting alumni after 20 or so years of showing top arts, and some of them have you know really major artists, or they've gone into other creative disciplines and so on, who are all very supportive and protective of it as something too, because they said the validation at that age by a state institution yeah. changes your life. Oh, it would. It also yes. gets parents thinking differently. That, yeah. you know, this yeah. is a very serious pursuit and they yeah. should make sure it's supported and so on. So we get a lot of heartfelt stories, but it's beautifully put together every year by our education team yep. who do go across the entire state mm. to receive entries and then try to narrow it down. Interestingly, though, I do say every year, you do narrow it down and each year is different. But the themes that underpin it every year are almost the same. It's, it's oh. always around angst, yeah. isolation, <laughs> introspection. I mean, you get all those things that we all did when we were 17. Of course. All reflected back at yeah. you. Yeah. And it, it's fascinating. It's moving. Yeah. The degree of talent and creativity at that age too is at times just yeah. uh, overwhelming. So here we are with the NGV, you know, like the, the two major galleries and this new one be, being uh, just about ready to start. Uh, it's it's a whole day, at least now, to, to go between the two. And and what I, f I find with a lot of exhibitions, people will say to me, oh, I, I just, I ran out of time, or I, I, I just didn't want to put anything more into my, my brain. I'm coming back next week. You know, like the return of people coming back to the NGV. Uh, are you aware of that? I'm sure you, yeah. you're asking people. We are, we do a lot of market research, yep. repeat visitation, from a local and a national audience is very high, which mm. is rewarding. Mm. It used to be a time when you'd go once a decade and you sort of tick the box and, you know, I'm done my next decade I'll be back. Uh, now it's a case of coming two, three, four times a year, yeah. which is, is incredibly rewarding. I mean, it's very interesting people that love a, an exhibition. I know from my own friends with the Queer Show, it's only been on for three or four, four weeks and I already know so many people that have had multiple visits yep. because it's got a d dense content, mm. it's a large, complex show. And it's quite emotive for people mm. to be negotiating all these new stories that they're reading. Mm. So they want to download it, process it, and go back into it. And I yeah. think that's a beautiful way to engage with artwork, mm. rather than just the, the usual two second glance and move to the next yep. work. Yep. To really consider something mm. or one thing and mm. go back to it. Yep. And we noticed we had a, we've had a surge in numbers across the last 10 years. Oh, okay. We've gone from a, an audience base 10 years ago of around 1.1, 1 .1, 1 1.2 mm. million, to up to 3.2 million Whoa. just before COVID. Yep. And a high percentage of that was a national re uh, visitor that was coming back yep. more than once. Yep. So it's interesting that it's, it's, mm. it's a very real phenomenon. Mm. And then you've taken it to the, the other stage where your Friday nights, mm. um, which have become so popular with whatever exhibitions on and you know, out in the garden, there's you know, f um, food and wine and- DJs. Yeah, yeah. We were quite nervous when we decided to move our late nights from a Wednesday to a Friday. As we said, well, we're now up against every other social <laughs> alternative you've got. This had better be good. Yeah. And so a team of people worked on that to make it really vibrant and mm. to make each one different, each series changes and so on. But, you know, a lot of creativity is put into that in terms of the type of entertainment, the food, the light, everything about it. Mm. And it's the same ticket price as going to see the, the pay exhibition, but you get all of that value mm. added on. And so mm. we pretty much um, reach our target for those every Friday night. Fantastic. Yeah, they're wonderful. And again, it's a different demographic generally that yeah. comes to that. And bringing a different person, type of person yep. into the gallery that might not have come, but they think, oh, yeah, let, let's try that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Smart. Thank you. Tony Elwood, thank you so much for chatting with us today and can't wait for the next um, 20 years to see what you're up to. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for giving me new, 20. <laughs> especially when you see the new building open. How, how exciting is that going to be? It's extremely that, exciting. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So Tony, I would thank you. My pleasure. You've been watching The Art Hunter. I'm David Hunt and we'll see you again real soon.